interesting panel. Um, and now I would need the presentation to start to introduce my panel. <laughs> Very well. Can we get the presentation on screen? Anyway. Thank you very much. So, the topic of the session is the resilience of vulnerable populations to climate change, opportunities and challenges for inclusive finance actors. And I just mentioned the panel, which is a very special and high caliber, high caliber panel of experts. Um, and we also have a very special setting because only two of them are actually here on stage and to others are joining us remotely. And um, as a first test of the setup of this session, I would like to introduce to you Johanna Niemann. She's the head of Inclusive Green Finance from the Alliance of Financial Inclusion, which is an uh, alliance of um, regulators. Johanna, can we do as a first test here a short welcome from your end? Thank you. Very good that we do the testing because we cannot hear you right now. Are you maybe on mute or is it the technic on this side? Joanna, can you say something again, please? Yes, so I can hear you very well. Okay, super. Great to have you on the panel. And now I also hear myself very well. <laughs> now we can hear you very well. Thank you very much. Um, great to have you on the panel. Um, the next person on the panel, also joining us remotely, is Isabel van Grunderbeek. She is head of advisory services um, for inclusive financial services at a very well-known and influential um, development bank, actually the European Investment Bank. Isabel, could we quickly do the same with you? And you say hi to the audience, please. Yes, please. She's offline. Okay, um, then we hope to solve that in, in a couple of minutes. I'm sure uh, you, you will reach her, otherwise we proceed. Actually, here on stage with us, next to me, is Mr. Uh, Lama Guya. He is the Director General, Lamin, I'm sorry, Mr. Lamin. <laughs> Uh, Guya, he is the Director General of Cori Microfinance, a microfinancial institution from Senegal. Very welcome, glad to have you on the panel. And the gentleman at the end is Mr. Raphael Agbarin. He is Investment Manager at Blue Orchard, a global impact investment manager. I like this introduction round. We have a complete check of all the of all the technique. So the microphone works. No, could we quickly turn up the microphones as well? Test one, two, three. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So with this um, <laughs> live test, I think we are very well set to start. Um, just for your information, I asked the panelists each to prepare an opening statement. Before that, I will give a bit of uh, setting of the stage, give a bit of an introduction to the topic, and um, maybe um, Charles kindly, kindly did the introduction. Um, as a background at Yapo Solutions, we are offering digital services for microfinance institutions, and especially um, including automatically climate risk indicators. So that, that reduces complexity in the whole context. I'm only stating this um, because in my introduction there will be a couple of examples and they will come from projects where I'm involved. So my background is much more from the digital side, less from the financial side, but I'm glad to have such an expert panel around me who can help me out whenever the financial expertise is needed. And with that, I would like to dive into the topic. We are talking today about vulnerable populations. <coughs> Vulnerable populations, I just put a couple of pictures from projects from our end here. Um, 
they are in many contexts. It's a lot of people. They can be in a rural context, they can be in an urban context, but there's one thing which they all have in common. Vulnerable people clearly have contributed least to climate change, but are the ones most affected. And basically one can say they're a victim of our industrial system, our industrial economic system. And out of that, um, especially for the inclusive finance sector, a challenge is occurring. And that challenge is, on the one hand, to identify vulnerabilities. This is what you see on the left-hand side of this slide. Understanding the vulnerabilities of clients and institutions, of financial in institutions. And that is the part of the right-hand side, identifying the adverse impacts. So to give clear examples on that, the left-hand side, the vulnerability, if I want to help out a client who's in a drought area, it might make a lot of sense to finance a drip irrigation system. So that will help him to increase his productivity and in case of a drought, bring his, bring his harvest home, so to say. And uh, that would be the more direct effect. But there are also the adverse impacts shown here on the right-hand side. An example here would be if we finance with a loan um, chemical fertilizer, for example, then we have a high risk that this increases productivity on the short run, but we might, might run the risk of destroying ecosystems and actually decreasing biodiversity. And that would be a very unpleasant adverse impact. And uh, these we have to identify as well when we want to do green inclusive finance properly in, um, in, the, in the coming years. So you can see them as risks. That's a clear financial perspective. But you can also see them as needs. And a view that I strongly urge for, and it was echoed uh, this morning in the opening panel by Dr. Dr. Richard Monang from UNAP, who said, Climate change represents risks, but it also represents opportunities. And this is a view that I would like to see and elaborate in the course of this session. And what, what we, a, a very good starting point to actually measure these vulnerabilities as well as adverse impacts is an evaluation. And uh, there's a, a very new evaluation or newly updated evaluation currently actually introduced by the Green Inclusive and Climate Smart Finance Action Group that is um, part of the European microfinance platform. It is around since 2013 and you have very prominent members in there. Um, you have ADA, for example, the organizers of this conference. You also have the Social Performance Task Forum for um, you also have Ceris in there, Yapo Solutions is also a member there. This is why, why I start with this. It's the Green Index. The Green Index is a tool to evaluate financial service providers. And actually, it serves a lot of, a lot of um, beneficial benefits, like awareness raising along the way. It helps financial institutions to determine where they stand with regard to their social and green performance and um, set priorities when they plan to set out a or to put in place an actual strategy and an action plan. This Green Index has a, has a long story. It started in 2014. The second version just uh, was released in 2016. And just this year, actually in November, um, the, the third, so the Green Index 3.0, the third version of it, will be released. And here we can see it includes vulnerabilities of clients in a very structured manner. And apart from that, it is also aligned with all other international standards. I mentioned also the Social Performance Task Force, the universal standards they, they have developed. So it is a very good tool and a very timely tool if one wants to start to evaluate and embark on a journey to include vulnerabilities and into credit decisions. And after this example from the microfinancial sector or the inclusive sector, 
Um, I want to go to a bit the broader, the, the broader discussion and the global trends we are facing. And uh, one taxonomy that clearly has to be uh, taken into account here is the EU taxonomy. Probably most have heard of it. The special thing why, why about this taxonomy, I'm not an expert on it and I'm not going into details here. Um, I have hopes that Isabel will be able to join us soon and likely she will be able to comment much more on it. Um, but it's interesting to see because it is the first time it is a different approach than what we have seen so far to make actually to, to measure risks and to basically measure sustainability. Um, it's a list of economic activities and all of these uh, economic activities have also been um, included with a benchmark basically highlighting what sustainable finance really means or sustainable economic activities. And if you look at the, the lower part, we see the, the six ob environmental objectives that make up the economy and these objectives actually determine whether an activity or when an activity can be considered as um, sustainable and environmental sound. And we see here also the second point that climate change adaptation is included there and also the last point, the protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems. Both are very, both are very closely related to vulnerability of end clients. And now I see a black screen. <laughs> Maybe we can, <laughs> until we, we have the presentation back on, um, this is one manifestation of an ongoing trend, another um, manifestation of this trend that adaptation is also considered on an international and, and broader context is the first climate adaptation summit that took place, it was hosted by the Netherlands, um, completely virtual, unfortunately, in, at the beginning of this year, in January, was a, a, a very good timing because it was after the US elections, so um, actually, the, the U.S. as the first, uh, first action they did was re-entering the Paris Agreement. Um, that was the first, the first time ever that there was a, a dedicated summit on this, on this size only focusing on adaptation. And during the opening statement of UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, he very clearly reminded all the participants of the Paris Agreement. And if you look at numbers, one, one thing sometimes it, it has been forgotten because all the ratifying countries actually committed to place a high amount, we are speaking about 100 billion US dollars in climate finance, but distribute them evenly between mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation being the the CO2 offset and adaptation really being adaptative measures fostering resiliencies against vulnerabilities to climate change. As a matter of fact, currently we stand much more at 95% of climate finance towards um, mitigation and only 5% towards adaptation. Hence also the importance of such a summit. And just as stated here, um, also the, the high numbers that the UN UNEP gap report, um, which he also cited in there, states for what is needed to address adaptation needs on a global level. And um, yes, it's, it's abstract numbers, but 70 billion US dollars would be the current need. 2030, we speak about 140 to 300 and 380 to 500 in 2050. That gives an idea of the dimension of the topic. There needs to be urgent action. It was uh, very interesting to hear that actually the African development banks, um, they lived up to the promise um, as it was formulated in the Paris Agreement and allocated 50% to adaptation as well as 50% to mitigation in their, in their climate finance efforts. And again, the clear, clear urge by the UN Secretary that all investments decisions must be climate resilient. And the Climate Adaptation Summit was also the, the starting point for a very interesting campaign hosted by the UNFCCC. Um, they introduced the Race to Resilience. 
that is a global action campaign um, that is solely dedicated to resilience. There's another action campaign, the Race to Zero, that has been around a bit longer, so people are might more familiar with it. That is dedicated to mitigation, but um, the Race to Resilience is only focusing on adaptation and has the goal to to um, include to <laughs> increase the resilience of four billion people worldwide, from vulnerable groups and communities until 2030. And I only put here the taxonomy because I was speaking at the, at the beginning a bit about taxonomies, Green Index, EU taxonomy. Also, they measure um, the, the, basically the results through different initiatives they put in place. These initiatives, they have to formulate pledges, their goals, what they try to achieve, and then there's a constant measuring of that so that you can actually track um, the success down the road. And... Um, there are a couple of initiatives in this, um, in this Race to Resilience, more than 25 by now, even though it has been, it's, it's young in history, actually. And I'm just putting this here to give an overview of what diverse topics are actually considered when it comes to adaptation. So we have, you can see that here, it can be focusing on mangroves, there's uh, access to energy, to efficient energy, the Water Resilience Coalition, and one more, with which is into resilience, and uh, I'm very sure we hear a bit later on from Raphael uh, in his opening statement. I want to focus now on a initiative where we are as, as Yapu personally involved, and hence I can speak about it. We found together with Gava Capital, which is a Spanish impact investor, as well as CIAT, CJIAR, um, who is a, a conglomerate of, of scientific institutes dedicated to climate change, an own initiative where we basically aim to make 3 million smallholder farmers more resilient by 2030. And we want to do so by onboarding microfinancial institutions and basically create an ecosystem where investors, facilitators like CRCJIR, us, and the microfinancial institutions as agents of change really really contribute to bettering the life of smallholder farmers and increase their resilience by creating access to nature-based solutions and facilitating the conditions and, and mechanisms to provide financing for them. Um, so far we launched in, in Latin America, but I'm mentioning it here because we will launch uh, in November and I would be very happy to see many of the participants here join our course. I just mentioned nature-based solutions. Maybe someone is not familiar with the, with the term. Um, it brings me to, to the next example. Here just a few of them are listened because as a financial institution, you also have to have, to have a product and service which you are financing with your loan in order to increase in resilience. And here's a bit, it's, it's, it's by no means complete, um, but it gives a bit an idea. So we have more technology-oriented nature-based solutions, efficient irrigation, for example, but we also have agricultural practices like organic agri agriculture. And that brings me to the last example, which is a clear example from the field, really, the MEBA project. Um, MEBA project was has a longer history. I'll get to that to a moment, but it's a project we implemented with UN Environment Program, and it clearly had the objectives to increase the capacity on the side of microfinancial ins institutions to give out adapt adaptive loan products that increase the resilience of mo mostly smallholder farmers, so really increasing resilience on the ground. And as we say here, as we see here, the second second objective: strengthening the client's ability to implement adaptation options, so the whole knowledge about it and the, the application about it, in general, the capacity, and of course, influencing the political agenda was also a topic. The benefits were, were big. Um, we, we speak of e better ecosystems, more diversified income on, on the end client's side, and, um, and increased resilience for the end clients. Also, today, um, there were altogether more than, than 30 million US dollars in green credits um, dispersed. And uh, that 
relates to more or less 70, more than 17,000 credits. This gives a bit an overview of the involvement of the project and the partners involved. Um, I'll not go into details for the first phase from 2012 to 2017, and it was focused on Latin America back in the days, only two countries, five institutions. The second phase, I can speak much more about be because we were involved, was from 2018 to 2020, with actually less funding behind and a much wider geographical outreach. And it's interesting because it also reached West Africa. So we were, you can see Cori Microfine is there, you see La Banca Cricole, you see Komuba, and you see Vahatra. Basically, we speak of Senegal and the Bana and um, Madagascar, where the program was also implemented. And maybe interesting because this is something that is always sought after. It was also able to attract private investment, most notably BNP Paribas, the Fondation Crédit Grameen Agricole, and um, Fondation Finanzas BBVA and Bank Holdex in Latin America. And um, just so one, one understands what happened in, in the MEBA project, um, it was really a, a very thorough intervention. It started off with basically an institutional inter, um, evaluation on five dimensions. It's really the information management, so how information flows in the institution, um, the, the actually the selection of EBA solutions. EBA is a subjection of nature-based solutions, so what I just showed you is exactly what is meant here with that dimension. The risk management that needed to be adjusted as well as the products and services and later on the marketing. And because institutions are, have different levels of maturity and one has to cater to that in order to be able to find a really suiting, customized, individualized strategy, and uh, this was done in the first phase, and after the strategy was formulated, it was implemented, and this is now a, a very yeah, a, a simplified uh, a slide, but what happened basically is that processes um, were adjusted, processes and policies, internal policies, um, EBA solutions were identified because you actually need to see first, okay, which are actually available in the given context, geographical context of a given institution, and then focus, uh, focus solutions were chosen. And uh, after that has happened, a green loan product was developed around that. And then there was also support in actually marketing these green credits. And after that, a pilot phase was conducted in most of the cases with, with uh, the software also, but that really served only the po purpose of reducing complexity um, in, this, in this context. And after the pilot phase, the, the aim was that actually those green credits were included in the business model. And the effect that was, that was as, as I just showed in the results, was really that verified green EBA credits were given out, dispersed, and thereby supporting vulnerable populations. And with this, uh, ah, also here on the website, in case you want to, more, uh, you want to know more about that project, um, there has also been uh, a phase after that, but I don't want to go too much into details, um, and I think I've talked long enough now. Um, I would actually like to hand with this uh, explanation of, of the last really tangible example from the field, the word to Lamin, because he can actually speak also of his experience of Meba, and I'll be very interested in hearing his opening statement. And I'll reach you at the point of mm -hmm. Lamine, please. Voilà. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci beaucoup, Anes. Uh, C'est un plaisir d'être là cet après-midi pour partager avec vous notre petite expérience dans le domaine. Et au moment où nous nous trouvons, je crois que il est intéressant qu'on puisse s'interroger un peu sur que vient faire une petite institution, en tout cas une jeune institution de microfinance, dans des thématiques comme la préservation de la biodiversité, les changements climatiques, les perturbations des écosystèmes. Alors, en menant cette réflexion, on se rend compte que c'est dans une logique très cohérente, en réalité, les pouvoirs publics au plus haut niveau 
on fait travailler des spécialistes, des experts. Il y a quelques années, quand on parlait de changement climatique, de biodiversité, pour la plupart d'entre nous, ça a relevé un peu de choses aériennes, ça a relevé à la limite euh, de, 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 des choses qui ne sont pas très concrètes. Mais aujourd'hui, chacun de nous peut témoigner justement de ces effets dramatiques du changement climatique. Parce que quand on parle de disparition d'espèces animales, quand on parle de désertification, quand on parle de sécheresse, quand on parle de destruction des terres cultivables, qui représentent une partie très faible de la totalité donc des terres euh, de, de ce monde, je crois qu'aucun acteur ne doit rester sensible autour de cette question. Et c'est justement la raison pour laquelle notre institution s'est engagée dans le projet que M. Anès a rappelé tout à l'heure, qui est le projet MEBA, microfinance, basé sur les écosystèmes. Microfinance pour l'adaptation basée sur les écosystèmes. Et justement, pour aborder cette question, il y a plusieurs points que j'aimerais aborder avec vous. Qui sommes-nous d'abord Nos motivations face au changement climatique, les défis auxquels on devait faire face avant de rentrer dans le projet, le projet lui-même, qu'est-ce qu'on a réalisé Les opportunités et surtout les perspectives et les contraintes. Coris est une institution sénégalaise qui est régie par la loi, donc une institution régulée, qui est une propriété de l'Église catholique. Autant moi-même, directeur général, depuis sa création, je suis musulman et je m'appelle Mohamed. Ça, c'est une particularité du Sénégal que j'aime toujours souligner. Institution de l'Église, dont la gouvernance est assurée par les caritas diocésaines, l'amicale du personnel et les femmes bénéficiaires. C'est une gestion voilà, confiée à des professionnels sans aucune distinction ni de race, de religion et de conviction idéologique. On couvre 13 régions sur les 14 du pays avec un encours de crédit de 23 millions de dollars, 10 millions d'encours d'épargne et un total client de 118 000. Alors, nos motivations, je l'ai dit tantôt, alors, il y, y a un point que, que j'aimerais souligner ici. Vous savez, tous les principes et valeurs de Cori sont tirés de la doctrine sociale de l'Église. Et au niveau de cette doctrine sociale de l'Église, il y a un principe essentiel, c'est la préversation du bien commun, qui dit que toutes les ressources, toutes les ressources de la nature ont une destination universelle. Et chaque acteur a le devoir de préserver cette ressource-là, ces ressources-là universelles. En plus de cela, nous, nous avions envie de faire face à nos engagements tant social et environnemental en étant une institution de microfinance socialement responsable. Dans notre vision, vous allez voir le socialement responsable qui vient avant le financièrement viable pour qu'il y ait un bon équilibre en direction des populations. Mais, il y a un truc qui me... Il y a quelque chose que je ne comprends pas. Alors, faire face aussi à la situation de vulnérabilité et d'exposition élevée des petits producteurs agricoles au changement climatique, mettre en application des mesures d'adaptation contribuant à réduire leur vulnérabilité et améliorer la sécurité alimentaire de leur famille, mais renforcer la capacité des producteurs agricoles et des communautés en général pour qu'ils puissent réussir, qu puissent réussir à prévenir, atténuer et à s'adapter aux impacts causés par les conditions climatiques extrêmes. Pour cela, il y a un certain nombre de défis, défis que l'institution devait faire face. C'est quoi C'est que les risques climatiques et écosystémiques étaient non intégrés
Donc, je vais continuer en attendant. Alors, il euh, y a un défi extrêmement important, c'est que dans nos processus d'instruction des demandes de financement, les institutions de microfinance euh, intègrent rarement les aspects liés au climat, à la biodiversité. Ce qui fait qu'il y a un biais extrêmement important dans l'évaluation des dossiers de crédit. Voilà, c'est bon. Voilà, c'est bon maintenant. Alors, il y a l'insuffisance aussi de formation du personnel sur la thématique du changement climatique et un déficit d'information des clients sur les risques climatiques. L'analyse des risques climatiques aussi qui était non intégrée, je l'ai dit, dans le processus de gestion et de suivi même des clients. L'absence d'outils de gestion intégrés pouvant aider à déterminer le degré d'exposition du portefeuille de crédit face à cette menace. Sur le plan réglementaire, aucune composante n'intègre spécifiquement la structure de ces risques. Vous tous, vous savez, en tout cas, ce qui concerne la zone UMOA, nous avons des ratios prudentiels, nous avons des indicateurs de performance financiers, mais il n'y en a nulle part une, un indicateur qui prend en compte cet aspect lié au changement climatique, en tout cas aux risques environnementaux. Le projet MEBA, qui nous a en tout cas appuyé en nous sélectionnant donc comme une première IMF en Afrique de l'Ouest, afin d'expérimenter ces risques climatiques et environnementaux. L'objectif, c'était de tester différents outils. Eh ben, quand on dit outils, eh ben, c'est vraiment des activités qui sont adaptées au changement climatique et l'utilisation de logiciels pour numériser, digitaliser, pour intégrer et opérationnaliser le processus de crédit à travers les composantes suivantes. Il y a les indicateurs de risque, eh ben, donc, adaptation au changement climatique avec la sensibilité et capacité d'adaptation des solutions. Les, la vérification des solutions, est-ce que c'est une bonne solution, oui ou non. La méthodologie de crédit aussi, intégrant des cartes de données référentielles normalisées et des calculs automatisés, automatisés de flux de trésorerie. Peut-être tout à l'heure, en espérant y revenir, nous disposons d'un logiciel qui nous permet, sur un lieu donné, d'avoir les données climatologiques, les données pédologiques, les données, en tout cas, climatiques en général, qui nous permettent d'avoir une idée sur la moyenne, sur une longue durée, en fonction donc, du, du climat et de la spéculation, de pouvoir, en tout cas, anticiper sur la production attendue et sur les risques encourus par le producteur. À travers la phase pilote que nous avons menée dans la région de Saint-Louis, donc, nous avons d'abord commencé par sélectionner plusieurs solutions donc, qui sont adaptées au changement climatique. Et il y a six qui ont été testées et finalement, nous avons retenu quatre solutions. C'est quoi L'irrigation goutte à goutte. Il le disait tantôt, quand il n'y a pas assez de flux, il faut irriguer, bien sûr. La diversification des cultures aussi, c'est important. La mise en place de biodigesteurs qui permet d'avoir non seulement de l'engrais organique, mais qui permet d'avoir du, du gaz pour, en tout cas, avoir un peu euh, pour la cuisson dans les ménages. Et ça permet de faire recours de moins en moins euh, au, au bois et au charbon de bois. Mais l'utilisation de l'engrais organique, comme je l'ai dit, qui est un, un, un produit, un sous-produit de ces biodigesteurs. Alors, nous avons aussi élaboré des fiches techniques la carte de produits, les canaux de communication, ainsi que des messages clés pour faire la promotion auprès des, des destinataires, des cibles qui étaient un peu les agriculteurs. Toujours pour les réalisations, nous avons effectué des ajustements sur notre méthodologie de crédit, bien sûr, pour intégrer surtout tous les domaines liés à l'environnement et au changement climatique, sur le, et en se concentrant sur l'inclusion d'indicateurs clés de la méthodologie d'adaptation au changement climatique et de sensibilité. Le choix de Yapu Solutions 
et option de numériser le processus de crédit via le logiciel fourni, la revue et la validation de la plateforme Yapou, parce que quand Yapou est arrivé aussi, nous avons apporté nos, nos observations afin de l'adapter à la réalité donc, de chez nous. Donc des suggestions d'amélioration, bien sûr, et la formation surtout des utilisateurs à ce logiciel. Nous avons utilisé le logiciel pour des options avec euh, leur euh, plateforme Smart Data, Data, Finance, Data Finance, Finance et intégration des facteurs climatiques et risques environnementaux avec quelques amendements au niveau de la, de la forme. Financement de 150 biodigesteurs au profit de petits producteurs et groupements de producteurs pour un montant de 388 000 US et un montant de 87 000 a été décaissé pour le compte de 31 petits producteurs agricoles dans la zone de Saint-Louis. Quels sont les avantages et les opportunités Alors, pour Coris, l'avantage était cette possibilité de participer à la deuxième phase du projet MEBA, microfinance, pour l'adaptation au changement climatique, avec un accent sur la gestion de l'information, la gestion des risques et les solutions, donc EBA, avec les avantages et opportunités suivantes. Il y a les avantages pour Cori d'abord, mais aussi il y a les avantages pour les producteurs. Pour Cori, donc, ce n'est pas très visible, peut-être lisible, mais c'est améliorer la gestion des risques liés aux prêts agricoles. Donc, grâce à des méthodologies intelligentes pour le climat. Une plus grande efficacité grâce à la préparation et à l'utilisation de solutions fondées sur les, te les technologies d'information et de communication. Un apprentissage accéléré et soutenu grâce à la concentralisation et la systématisation du savoir-faire institutionnel. C'est important. Et la segmentation des clients et des produits et services sur mesure grâce à une gestion complète et saine des données. Mais pour les producteurs, c'est important. Il y a une stabilisation des revenus à travers les diversifications et le renforcement des activités productives. La capacité accrue de faire face aux risques liés au climat, d'améliorer les pratiques agricoles et de gérer de manière durable les écosystèmes. Mais l'amélioration de la capacité de faire face aux dettes et d'épargner en cas d'urgence pour les besoins futurs. Comme avantage et opportunité aussi, il y a l'utilisation de cette plateforme même sur la biodiversité et qu'on peut citer comme avantage le process d'abord, amélioration de l'analyse du crédit, c'est extrêmement important si on sait le rôle de l'agriculture et le rôle que les institutions de microfinance doivent jouer dans sa promotion. Aussi au niveau des risques, il y a une intégration des risques climatiques et de biodiversité dans l'analyse du risque de crédit. Mais il y a une opportunité d'accéder à beaucoup de financements. Il l'a dit, il y a énormément d'argent et ça, ça sera une bonne base pour notre institution de pouvoir accéder aux lignes de financement vers, à travers le monde. En perspective, c'est capitaliser cette expérience en mettant en adaptation des solutions d'adaptation en vue de promouvoir des pratiques agricoles durables et respectueuses de l'environnement. Généralisation de la plateforme Yapou dans tout le réseau de Cori, parce que le test j'ai dit c'est à Saint-Louis. Notre objectif c'est de généraliser dans tous nos bureaux. L'utilisation de, de cette même démarche méthodologique pour introduire d'autres solutions. Parce que nous avons appris beaucoup de, de Meba et de Yapou. Nous avons dit nous devons pouvoir l'utiliser, cette démarche méthodologique, pour faire mieux encore. Et en partenariat avec l'entreprise Bioenergy Green, nous avons déployé un projet d'inclusion de 8 000 petits producteurs dans les chaînes de valeur verte au Sénégal pour un coût total de 3 835 000 dollars US. Mais aussi, en perspective, nous allons accroître l'accès aux énergies, aux énergies renouvelables et aux engrais organiques et destinés au secteur agricole donc, de, notre, de notre pays. Nous voudrions quand même remercier... Hein, ONU Environnement, qui a soutenu ce projet, le ministère de l'Environnement de la République fédérale d'Allemagne, la fondation Gramin, Anes l'a dit tout à l'heure, surtout Yapou, Solution, j'ai oublié de le dire, BNP Paribas, de le citer, BNP Paribas aussi, nous a accompagnés dans cette aventure. Voilà, je remercie le charmant public qui nous suit cet après-midi. Merci encore.
Thank you very much, Lamin, um, for this yeah very thorough and first-hand, very thorough uh, summary of the first-hand experience, and uh, yeah, also stressing challenges as well as the opportunities on the way, and stressing the learning curve because uh, yeah, this is something we all have uh, in this topic of adaptation. It is a new t in, in that severity a new topic, and we all have to learn how to actually find the best ways to deal with it. With that, I'll give the word to Raphael, um, who will actually be a very interesting next opening statement because I know that Blue Orchard has engaged a lot in actually resilient insurances. And with that, he represents the other half of, uh, of adaptation. So on the one hand, we have measures which are ex ante, so before uh, a climate event takes place, and then an insurance would represent more the ex post part so in being more resilient in case a uh, climate effect has taken place and uh, has affected vulnerable populations. Rafael, please. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, so by way of, of introduction, uh, my name is Rafael Agbora. So I'm an investment officer for Blue Orchard Finance, which is an impact investment uh, management firm uh, dedicated to financial inclusion with um, 20 years of uh, experience uh, in investment in, uh, in microfinance. Um, over the last five years, we have diversified, uh, the, the uh, Blue Orchard Finance has diversified its activities into um, different impact investment teams, um, which also includes now education finance, uh, capacity building, but also uh, climate finance. Um, by climate finance, the approach we have taken is, um, as Agnes was mentioning, is, um, is more considered as an ex post. So, um, an insurance after the, the occurrence of the, of, the, um, of the climate event. So by exports, we, we, we intend any uh, financial risk transfer mechanism uh, that facilitate the recovery of the vulnerable populations after the occurrence of the disaster. Um, I would like to draw four observations with you that actually justify the need to have uh, climate insurances available for emerging markets. Um, if the presentation could be displayed. Yes, so I would like to draw four observations. Um, the first one is that the frequency of climate events is on the rise, uh, being earthquake, tsunami, tropical storm, flood. Um, the number of extreme weather and natural catastrophe events has tripled over the last four decades. Um, and this has led to an estimation of um, two trillion US dollar of economic damages worldwide in the last decades, according to Swiss Re. Um, uh, in view of those economic damages, uh, energy markets are more exposed to climate risks. Uh, the losses from natural disasters are 1.5 to three times higher in low income and emerging economies compared to industrialized economy. Um, in addition to that, uh, the emerging markets uh, have a lower insurance coverage. Uh, they are less protected from climate risk despite their high exposure and effects on livelihood, particularly for the poor and the vulnerable. Um, besides this dark picture on the impacts of climate changes, there are a reason for hope and for optimism, um, being the insurance uh, products that are uh, being becoming now available uh, to emerging market countries and to uh, poor and vulnerable populations. Um, thanks to the spread of and the progress in technology, um, we have seen increasing amount of uh, measurement technology and parametric insurances along with technology that distribute and um, handle the, cl the claims handling uh, of the insurance products. It's in view of those observations that the Insure Resilience Investment Fund has been initiated in 2013 uh, by the German Development Bank, KLW, on behalf of the German Ministry for Econo Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, the fund is entirely managed uh, by uh, Blue Orchard Finance and act started its activity in 2015 and is part of the Insure Resilience uh, Global Partnership, as mentioned by earlier, which is a partnership that brings together countries, civil society, uh, international organizations, but also academia and private sector, uh, and whose, whose objective is to enable the reliable disaster response using climate and disaster risk finance and insurance, so and, and insurance solutions. 
Um, so the fund, the fund Insure Resilience Investment Fund uh, has the objective to facilitate the adaptation uh, to climate change by improving the access to and the use of climate insurance solutions uh, in developing countries. Uh, it, it aims at improving the resilience of poor and vulnerable populations as well as micro, small and medium enterprises to weather events. Uh, it does so by financing qualified companies along the value chain of insurance uh, with main operations in official development countries. Uh, it is set up as a public-private partnership, um, um, uh, capturing public finance funds along with uh, private investments, and has four different instruments, two um, sub-fund private debt and private equity along with two grant facilities uh, that facilitate the, or that are dedicated to the investees uh, to facilitate the technical assistance and uh, support to the premium, to the insurance premiums uh, of the end borrowers and the insured populations. The fund uh, invests uh, along the world sector, the fund is having a world sector approach to climate insurance by enabling the value chain for climate insurance. Uh, it can invest in different kind of entities, uh, the private equity sub fund uh, being dedicated to investing in service providers that provide data and software solutions related to climate data. Um, those data being sold to insurance providers that need the data to uh, design in climate insurance products. Um, the equity fund can also invest in insurance and reinsurance companies that are dedicated to climate insurance uh, products. And the private debt sub fund, and uh, which can be relevant for, um, uh, which is very relevant to that case, uh, is investing in the aggregators. And by aggregator, we mean every microfinance institutions, cooperatives, but also telecom telecommunication operators that make the links between the insurance companies and uh, the population, the rural populations. Um, that, that need protection from climate change events. And by, by investing in the world value chain, the result is that it increases the resilience of the populations uh, from financial distress. Uh, the insurance cover increases climate resilience by helping recover from climate impacts with timely payouts, as well as increasing financial inclusion and, an, and an access to credits. So what are the benefits uh, for the populations? of a climate insurance product. First of all, it increases the financial stability and the resilience. Uh, farmers are able to better manage the risks. They are uh, not forced to sell their productive assets and to reduce food consumption or migration. They have a better access to funding. Uh, climate insurance at the household level allow farmers an easier, an easier access to credits, providing partial security. As Lamin was mentioning earlier, uh, microfinance institutions include more and more climate risks in their uh, credit analysis and such a climate insurance will be a good mitigant and a good, a, a good security uh, to obtain uh, loans and to have a better access to credit. Uh, it also increases the productivity and the innovation with the better credit availability. Um, it allows farmers to invest in technologies that boost their productivity. And finally, it also increases, uh, well, it improves the future of the farmers by not being forced to remove their children from school during the periods of financial distress, they can provide their children with a better education. So along with the financing of investees, uh, being microfinance institutions, but also um, cooperatives and other um, um, investees in the value chain of climate insurance, um, the fund also provides a technical assistance facility, which is a grant that gives access to the investees like microfinance institution and has an access to international expertise to launch and boost climate insurance. Um, so IIF is partnering up with Celsius Pro, which is an insure tech that specializes in industrializing index insurance solutions. And partnering with a local, local consulting, consulting firm can provide uh, good services to the investees that help the microfinance institutions, for example, to uh, develop a business strategy, a planning, a product development, uh, and also the education of the various stakeholders uh, that the microfinance institutions are working with in the space of climate insurance. Uh, this technical assist assistance facility has proven to contribute to the growth of microfinance institutions in the climate insurance uh, space. It reduces the time to market and the even sees setup cost uh, by facilitating the access of microfinance institutions to the distribution of climate insurance products. 
along with the technical assistance facility, the fund also provides a premium support facility, which is a grant that provides temporary subsidies to reduce the climate insurance premiums paid by the clients. Uh, the, premium super, the premium support facility rationale is that it makes insurance policies more affordable in the introductory phase of climate insurance products when the uncertainty is still high. But it also increases the demand for climate insurance products in order to reach critical mass and promote the sustainability of climate insurance solutions. Um, it has been reported that investees of, uh, of the Insure Resilience Investment Fund have, have the support of this premium support facility has been catalytic in supporting their outreach to clients. By way of making the fund a bit more tangi tangible to the audience, um, I, I would like to talk a little bit about the Cash Foundation, which is um, uh, an university of the Insure Resilience Investment Fund. I would have liked to show an, an example of, of a microfinance institution in Africa. However, our portfolio um, in the depth, the, the sub-fund depth uh, of the portfolio has as limited amount of uh, microfinance institution in the, uh, as an example. Um, however, the Cash Foundation, Foundation in Pakistan um, is currently reaching 9,500 women farmers with climate insurance linked livestock loan in Pakistan. Uh, so it provides loans to um, farmers uh, which, for which uh, livestock insurance is mandatory uh, in order to receive the, the, the credits. Um, and the impact has been that the Cash Foundation, according to a survey, um, as, as indicated that insurance payouts were mostly frequent, most frequently used to repay the existing loans, allowing the clients to then reinvest in new animals uh, with additional loans. Uh, and the benefits of the climate insurance in that case is that, um, according to the same survey, two-thirds two of the respondents experienced the climate shock in the past 24 months, with pest and disease and heavy rainfall being the most common shocks experienced. The clients invest uh, the payouts in their businesses. Uh, the payouts from the insurance were largely reinvested in beneficiaries' businesses, which suggests that the product is serving, is serving its purpose in allowing clients to recover from the climate shocks. Although the sample size of the survey is still small, um, to draw very firm conclusions, uh, the data still supports that the hypothesis the, the data still supports the hypothesis that the insurance is helping to recover from better climate shocks. Microphone. Ah, wonderful. So thank you very much, Raphael. Um, that is a yeah, that is a very interesting financial mechanism that you have in place there. Um, and uh, yeah, we will probably embark later after after we heard from the others their positions um, a bit more on the ex ante ex post conundrum. Uh, with that, I would like to hand the word to Johanna who I hope is still online after a, a long time of waiting. <laughs> Jana, can you still hear us? Currently, I cannot yet see you. Can we bring her to the screens, please? Ah, wonderful. Time <laughs> Hi, Joanna. So, please, um, um, we are very interested in hearing the, yeah, let's say, meta perspective, the regulator's perspective, and um, I'm very much looking forward to your opening statement. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hannes. Can you hear me okay? Very much so, please. Very good, thank you. And, and really a pleasure joining you today remotely. Uh, of course, I would rather be with you in Kigali today, but I am joining you from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Just one moment. So I will bring to you the regulatory perspective of inclusive green finance. Uh, we have had really splendid introductions today and it's been very interesting to listen to the fellow panelists bringing very concrete examples as well. Uh, I'm gonna uh, speak about inclusive green finance from a regulatory perspective, representing the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, a network of 100 regulators and central banks from across the world, working on advancing financial inclusion through peer learning and um, learning together. 
can I please ask the technical support to try to reduce the feedback? That's why I'm speaking very slow right now. Okay. Because I, I can see. hear my own voice all the time. <laughs> so <sorry>. Yes, of <laughs> course. Can we please, on the one, probably we have to mute it on our end, exactly, the one channel, and maybe also see the slides. Um, to my knowledge, uh, Joanna can actually steer them and we can stay with the same presentation. That would be great. Jonna, could, do you still have that? Okay, very good. I can still hear myself, but we're going to press ahead. So if you could please project my presentation on the screen. Hear me? Oh, wonderful. Joanna, sorry, we're, we're sorting it out. Give us one minute. Um, I'm sure you'll have the, the slides in a moment and hopefully no echo anymore. Um, we worked this morning, I'm sure. We will make it work again. <laughs> Just. It's okay. I can start the presentation without the slides. <laughs> um, so um, the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, actually the journey on inclusive green finance started back in 2015. And uh, there was some discussions amongst financial regulators uh, recognizing that uh, climate change will have a very negative impact on the, the gains made through financial inclusion in the past years. But also there was a recognition that there is another side to the coin, which basically is by advancing financial inclusion, you will also build the resilience to the impact of climate change and at the same time, maybe even empower individuals and MSMEs to reduce their own negative impacts on the environment. So exactly what we've been discussing about here. And in this whole package, of course, also regulators have a very important role to play. There has been a quite a big realization um, globally about the role regulators, central banks have in terms of advancing green finance. Um, but this far, a lot of it has been focusing on green bonds and large-scale mitigation projects. Also some, but not as many as pointed out earlier by Hannes, some large-scale adaptation projects. But the real value and the real uniqueness of inclusive green finance is this is really empowering the individuals and the MSMEs to build their own resil resilience to the impacts of climate change and maybe also enable them to mitigate their own contribution to climate change or their own contributions to uh, biodiversity loss. Uh, the logic is very clear. Uh, we've been hearing some examples here today. Uh, having access to especially formal savings, it acts as a buffer against cost increases. It's a way of diversifying risks uh, and it can be an important element as we heard earlier as well. It's about investing in low carbon technologies, but also rebuilding and reconstruction.
technical uh, difficulties uh, and anything, please feel free to reach out to me as well. Thank you so much. So much, Johanna. Um, and we have to apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, that was very brave how you continued your presentation uh, without seeing the slides. Thank you, thank you for that. Very professional. Um, do we have Isabel by now online and approachable? That's another question. Can we bring her to the screen? Isabel, can you hear us? Can I get a yes or no maybe whether she's reachable? She is wonderful. Okay, then wonderful to hear about that regulator's perspective. Um, I hope we see Isabel soon on the screen as we are starting to run out of time. <laughs> I'm happy to speak now, but Wonder I can barely hear you. You can barely hear me. Can you hear me a little, Isabel? Very welcome. Can and could you follow the other statements so far? Isabel, can you hear us? It seems the answer is no. <laughs> can we maybe, Isabel, can you hear us? I probably start to, to tell a joke or something that everyone's laughing in the audience, but I'm not very good at telling jokes, so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Okay, now Isabel, can you hear us now eventually? That would be great. Isabel, can you hear me? Well, what else can I say? Um, Isabel, we can see you, but we cannot hear. Very well, maybe I'll give the technical setup a bit more time. Maybe, sorry? No, I don't. Hello, so if you can hear me, I, give, I receive signals that I should go ahead. <laughs> so good afternoon. Uh, please let me know if there is a, a problem with the quality of the voice, otherwise I will I will start now. And what I would like to be talking about today is how we see this topic at the European Investment Bank. So as you presented earlier, um, Hannes, we'll be talking on one hand on climate risk and how this affects uh, populations in Africa, but also about economic resilience because this influences how much you can uh, actually adapt to climate change and how much of, of course as well you're going to be affected. So these are two really interlinked factors uh, for vulnerable populations. So first let me introduce uh, EIB. EIB is the EU bank with shareholding from 27 uh, EU member states and our mission is to support EU policy objectives including outside the European, the European Union uh, through the West. End of 2019, the EU adopted the Green Deal and the EIB setting very ambitious targets effectively became the EU Climate Bank. The EU is committed to uh, slashing its net emissions to zero by 2050 and calls on other economies to raise their climate ambitions. So the EIB is here to really support uh, the, these ambitions and is already one of the main financiers globally of climate action. Uh, in particular, in Africa in 2020, uh, two thirds of our activity supports climate action and environment. So if you see the slide that I've prepared. This is a screenshot of our website where you can find 
a lot of resources about uh, climate finance and climate action. Uh, in particular, you could find our Climate Bank Roadmap 2021-2025, which, which outlines our goals in this area and gives an operational framework. Uh, soon, we will also be issuing a climate adaptation plan, and this is really in support of the EU adaptation strategy. You can find also other resources on you know, how we set the path for green bonds uh, from 27, for example, and other resources. So now if we turn to financial inclusion specifically, there are a number of topics that are of interest to us. As you know, uh, EIB has been an investor and a lender in the microfinance sector for a long time. And we're also managing technical assistance programs for microfinance institutions. So maybe in four points, um, you know, how we see this. First of all, microfinance itself is a factor for economic resilience. And as we said, you know, economic resilience helps with uh, vulnerability. So through saving solutions and also credit, it provides the means for micro-entrepreneurs to overcome the shocks that they may face, including related to climate change. Second, um, adaptation means, you know, can be translated into investments. So, for example, in the agriculture, as some of you have been talking about this, um, you know, it might mean investing in irrigation, um, or other types of investments. But also insurance, as was also mentioned, plays an important role, and we will increasingly take this into account in our own investments, supporting the microfinance institutions. Um, so in particular, how to connect our loans and insurance uh, products. Third, maybe I would like to uh, mention the off-grid solutions that are developing uh, in Africa, and we've been quite active in financing some uh, actors, some players in this market, because I, I do think that these solutions, solar host home systems in particular, do help build resilience as well, because energy is of course key to develop any sustainable economic activity. And I'm mentioning this because the off-grid solutions have been very often uh, deployed as a credit solution, so on a sort of leasing system, and microfinance institutions may play a role uh, in this area because of the how they know their clients. Um, and that, of course, plays a role in the capacity to, to deploy these off-grid solutions. And maybe four point, uh, I should also mention, of course, the resilience of the institutions themselves. Because, of course, if the institution itself is not adequately um, protecting itself against climate risk, then, you know, everybody, all of the clients are going to be affected. And I think this should be looked at in, in three steps. First of all, assess climate risk, develop a specific offer, so develop specific products, but also being able to report. So in all of these aspects, uh, technical assistance that we deploy as EIB can uh, be helpful to lenders in general, uh, banks, but also microfinance institutions. And we are placing more and more importance on these aspects as well going forward. So in summary, how you know the EIB can support this work of transforming and transitioning economies um, to to a greener economies um, and therefore working on the on 
the resilience of uh, micro entrepreneurs in particular is um, through lending. We're providing resources to uh, microfinance institutions where we can in local currencies. Uh, blending, so this could take the form of risk sharing, and we feel that this is particular, particularly important in this area. Um, as we said as well, as I mentioned, maybe combining insurance and lending, and advising through technical assistance projects. The most important is that you know the microfinance institution is our client. It's really the pilot. Uh, so any solution that we would deploy, we would first listen to your needs and where you want to go uh, to be able to, to co-build a solution. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, I hope you can hear it at least now. We could hear very well. Uh, yes. If again, it is it is a bit uh, uh, yeah a interesting technical setup we are we're experiencing today. Um, I apologize for you not being able to hear us. We heard you very well, um, and we are unfortunately yes very running out of time. So I would take the advantage to at least pose one question to uh, better to um, my panelists here in the in the room. Raphael, we at the beginning at the intro we. Uh, spoke about or quickly mentioned the ex ante ex post um, dimension of increasing re resilience on, amongst vulnerable groups. Isabel just picked the topic up, so EIV is trying to do the same to actually bring the two together. Can you briefly give me your opinion on why don't we see more of these efforts? Do they fit together? Do they not fit together? What is your, your perspective on it? So I, I would say that uh, the crew could go hand in hand, uh, like uh, push and pull forces um, that uh, adapt to each other. So if I take the example of exente adaptation to uh, climate change, uh, increasing the resilience of populations through development actions, for example, exente. So before uh, the occurrence of, this, of the disaster, by for example, uh, in implementing some irrigation system, investing in. Um, uh, biodiversity to increase the resilience before the, the, re the resilience of the population before the, the disaster. It reduces, uh, so it increases the protection of the, of the population. It reduces the exposure uh, to financial stress. And therefore, it can also decrease the insurance premiums that can be granted to, uh, the insurance premium that can be given by insurance company to the farmers. And on the other way around, uh, financial risk protection with climate insurances um, facilitate the access of farmers to credit, uh, allowing them to obtain capital and hence to increase their resilience by investing directly in uh, exente climate adaptation strategies. Uh, but if we take the perspective of a microfinance institution, uh, the role they can be playing in um, facilita facilitating their clients to access uh, financial protection uh, from climate change, um, one possibility could be to um, play the role of being an intermediary between uh, the insurance companies that provide climate insurance products and the rural population, which are often excluded from the financial services and even more excluded from the access to insurance services. Okay, so it actually goes hand in hand, you would say? It um, could go hand financial, in hand. Yes. There is actually the potential that MFIs could play in the intermediary. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for this. And if we think back on the, you, you presented a very concrete financial mechanism, um, the, the Intro Resilience Fund. Um, it, you mentioned it's globally. I saw the, the example from Pakistan, but it's globally. That includes all of Africa. It includes every emerging market, so every official development assistance countries, which also include every country in Africa. Yes. Okay, that means, should for example, Lamin and Kori decide to offer an insurance product, maybe that is interesting at some point, they could basically apply for TA and for funding from your fund? They can definitely, uh, we can definitely have a discussion and uh, it could lead to uh, a lending to Cori, which will lead to uh, an access to a technical assistance facility and uh, support to the, to the premium of the insurers, uh, which are clients of Cori, so that could be a possibility. Okay, that, that maybe, maybe that is interesting at some point. I, I 
personally think, and so I'm, I'm surprised, let's put it this way, that we don't see this development of insurance and so ex ante and ex post in more products combined, um, but I think it will be something in the future. Uh, please, oui. Lamin. Si, si, si. Voilà, si vous permettez, je voulais juste faire une petite précision, c'est que au niveau réglementaire, nous avons une limite au niveau de l'humour avec une, un cloisonnement clair entre les institutions financières et les compagnies d'assurance. Aujourd'hui, nous n'avons pas cette possibilité en tant qu'institution de microfinance de développer des produits d'assurance. Tout ce que nous pouvons faire au mieux, c'est d'être des intermédiaires entre la compagnie d'assurance et le client. Et là, notre rôle se limite juste à la collecte de la prime et à son reversement à la compagnie moyennant certainement une petite commission au passage. Dernièrement, la Fondation Gramine Crédit Agricole nous a proposé une opportunité d'avoir une formation, justement, qui a été financée, une assistance technique financée par la BI pour le développement de produits de micro-assurance, mais nous étions obligés de décliner parce que la réglementation, à l'étape actuelle, ne nous permet pas de le faire. C'est la précision que je voulais apporter. And, and that, thank you very much for this. That explains a lot. <laughs> so I will, I will not suggest this more. Um, we only have a few minutes left. I would like to have one statement, though, um, especially from you, Lamine, since, since you are an institution on the ground and uh, you have a lot of experience through the Maybach project, but also elsewhere. Um, and I would like to hear just briefly What are the biggest challenges that you were facing? Were they more internally in the institution? Were they more externally? If you would have to prioritize and see, ah, this is something we, we were struggling with when other institutions that, that would like to also embark on this journey of, of fostering resilience among vulnerable populations. Um, what, what would be your lessons learned stress, stressed most? La, la première difficulté euh, que nous avons eue sur le terrain, c'est d'abord au niveau de la collecte de l'information à la base. Parce que pour que cette démarche, cet outil puisse être fonctionnel, opérationnel, il faudra partir d'une situation de référence. Au niveau d'une région donnée, il faut récolter l'ensemble des informations, je dirais, j'avais dit dans l'exposé, sur une longue durée, pour avoir les moyens sur la, sur la pluviométrie, les types de sols, alors euh, les types de cultures, les itinéraires techniques. Et je, 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 je donne l'exemple au Sénégal. Nous étions obligés d'aller nous adresser à la Saïd. Saïd, les Sénégalais qui sont là connaissent, c'est une société d'État qui s'occupe de l'aménagement agricole et de l'encadrement des petits producteurs. Nous étions obligés de nous adresser à l'inspection régionale du ministère qui représente le ministère de l'agriculture, notamment la direction de développement rural, direction régionale de développement rural, mais c'est à ce niveau que nous avons enregistré les plus gros blocages. Parce que soit l'information n'existe pas, soit si elle existe, mais <rire> désolé, les gens vous disent qu'ils n'ont pas le temps voilà, pour se consacrer à votre programme, à votre projet pour aller chercher et rassembler toute l'information. Ça a valu un déplacement et, et exceptionnel pour que moi-même j'aille pendant deux jours pour essayer de taper à toutes les portes. Et malgré tout, nous n'avons pas eu à avoir toute l'information nécessaire. Alors que pour paramétrer le logiciel, il faut partir d'informations très fiables et d'informations pertinentes sur la localité qui est concernée. Et chaque fois que vous changez de région, les données vont changer. Ce qui se passe en termes de climat, d'environnement dans le nord du Sénégal est totalement différent de ce qui pourrait se passer dans le sud. Donc pour chaque région, il faut adapter le, le logiciel. L'autre contrainte que nous avons, c'est un peu hein, au début, comme un outil nouveau, la lourdeur un peu de, 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 de l'outil technique qui est la, la, la plateforme Yapu Solutions. Alors, il fallait former, hein, il fallait former tout le, le personnel impliqué, bien sûr, 
à l'implémentation de cet outil. Moi-même, j'ai eu à participer à plusieurs sessions de formation. Je salue au passage M. Davidé, Forcella, qui est perspicace, qui nous a vraiment soutenus dans ce processus. Ça a été quand même une contrainte, pas insurmontable, hein, mais c'était difficile de comprendre le logiciel, d'autant plus que la plupart des éléments étaient en anglais. Ça aussi, c'était une limite, alors que nous, nous sommes francophones. Alors, l'autre contrainte qu'on a eue et qui va, qui continue aujourd'hui, parce que les deux contraintes-là, on est en train de les dépasser, c'est le coût, le coût du logiciel. Le logiciel, nous trouvons que c'est encore un peu difficile à supporter le coût. Et cette première phase, nous étions soutenus par BNP Paribas et la Fondation Gramine. Mais si on doit généraliser, Hein, le coût du logiciel, de, en tout cas de l'exploitation de la solution, euh, risque de peser lourdement sur notre institution. Et c'est le lieu peut-être de faire un clin d'œil à la BI et à d'autres institutions, en tout cas qui soutiennent les initiatives vertes, de bien vouloir, en tout cas, nous accompagner pour cette généralisation. Mais aussi, clin d'œil donc, à Yapu Solution, pour voir dans quelle mesure il est possible, en tout cas, en fonction de l'échelle, bien sûr d'atténuer les coûts d'utilisation de ce logiciel. C'est un peu, moi, les contraintes que, que j'ai, j'ai identifiées, mais sur le terrain, nos agriculteurs pratiquaient déjà un certain nombre de, de, de solutions. Eh ben, hein, l'irrigation goutte à goutte, on la connaissait déjà. La diversification, on la connaissait déjà. Ce qui est peut-être nouveau, c'est au niveau des biodigesteurs. Et là, ça demande quand même aussi de la sensibilisation pour l'entretien de ces bio, bio, la construction d'abord, mais aussi l'entretien de ces biodigesteurs pour les rendre les plus performants possibles. Voilà, merci. Well understood. Um, thank you very much for, for this comment. Um, I, I, fu- I fully can relate to, um, especially the, the local um, component of adaptation that is actually a very important one. So the north of Senegal looks different than the south, and yes, then of course also um, adaptation measures have different effects um, in in terms of bringing bringing economic benefits. Um, <laughs> since <laughs> since it was the uh, of course, and I also understand that technical assistance is needed at times in order to facilitate tools. Um, nevertheless, of course, the rationale should be that the uh, efficiency gains and um, after after it is really adopted and working um, can can balance that out. So um, thank you very much for this. I know we are at the end. It's uh, 45, I think. Um, I will nevertheless leave, uh, leave the, or give the opportunity to the audience for one or two questions. Given all the technical difficulties we had in this session, I unfortunately uh, have to come to an end. There's a gentleman, I see that. Do we have another question? Otherwise, please, one microphone to the gentleman here on the left from my perspective, so he can pose his question. Ah, okay, then we do first him, and then not the gentleman over here, please not to forget. Sir, please. Mm-hmm. OK, merci pour, la, pour le micro, la parole. Je suis M. Eboman, André Paul, directeur général de la microfinance de l'Église catholique en RD Congo. J'apprécie, M. Ndiaye, le travail qui est abattu avec votre équipe. Et j'ai beaucoup d'admiration à cela. Et c'est un bon modèle pour nous. J'ai deux questions pour ma compréhension et renforcer notre intérêt. Première question, à quel moment dans la courbe d'expérience de Cori aviez-vous pris conscience de renforcer l'analyse de crédit orientée finance verte, finance agricole C'est ma première question. Deuxième question, en termes d'impact observable à l'issue de ce projet MEBA, qui est un projet pilote, quelle est la proportion que représente le bénéficiaire de finances vertes dans votre portefeuille en termes de portée et en volume 
Merci. I mean, I think they both go to you, no? Uh, yeah. Let's, let's hear the other question as well. Okay, uh, mine is not a question. Mine is more of a comment. My name is Asho Ashok Shah. I'm from APA Insurance Kenya. And what's, what we are doing is that we've been basically insuring crop and livestock. Uh, and it's, like a, it's a partnership. It's a private PPP with the Kenya government. And we have support from uh, MasterCard Foundation. And uh, we've been working with GIZ and other uh, World Bank and other donor, uh, donor organizations. Now, the two solutions with that we have given to the, uh, to the Kenyan farmers and to the livestock, uh, for livestock, for the pastoralist. The pastoralist livestock is really more of a climate change solution whereby the pastoralists in northern Kenya ensure, we ensure the forage on the ground for the pastoralists. When the forage is not enough, then we would send the, we do a payout to them to keep the livestock alive until the next rainy season. So that's uh, one, pro and we paid out in 2017 $7 million in claims to those pastoralists. In, in, so that, that's one area. The other area that we are working on is the crop insurance. Now, crop insurance, we have moved away from parametrics to area yield covers because parametrics is not very easy for the farmers to understand and it's very difficult for us to, uh, um, to apply. So we moved to area yield insurance whereby we would cover the area index for, every, for the crop and the yields will be known for that particular crop in that area. And when the season is finishing, we do crop counts. We go to do crop cuts and then we announce the crop cut and pay the farmer for the difference. Now the, the thing that we have is that we are working with aggregators. Uh, the aggregators provide the inputs to, uh, cover, uh, inputs to the farmer and they ensure the inputs, but unfortunately, the problem that we are f facing, and that's what we would like to work with the microfinance uh, institutions, is to give 100% cover to the farmer, because what we do is we give 70% yield cover. So when the farmer's yield is below 70%, we will pay up the difference to the farmer up to 70%. So the, I, that, that one is more of both a sustainability and climate cover because sustainability means that the farmer will always have a steady income to improve their farming practices and also continue with a better life. Thank you very much. So clearly also uh, a very important contribution, slightly different in dimension, but actually um, yeah, following, following your contribution, Raphael, maybe there's an interesting exchange after, after this panel could be fruitful, uh, is my feeling. Then, my feeling was both questions were directed to you, the earlier ones, Lamin, correct? Yes. Would you, would you just quickly answer Donc, them? Voilà, j'ai deux questions ouais. qui ont été posées par notre ami de la RDC, je crois, Alors, et qui concernent un peu à quel moment l'analyse du crédit Nous avons senti la, la nécessité d'intégrer les aspects liés au changement climatique. Et la deuxième question sur l'impact, en tout cas ce que représentent les financements verts sur le volume, voilà, sur le volume de financement. Quoi. Alors, d'abord, euh, Cori euh, vient de rentrer dans sa 16e année d'existence. Disons que pendant 12 ans environ, nous faisions que les financements de groupes, de grands groupes de femmes avec des crédits qui n'étaient pas orientés du tout. C'est-à-dire, l'objectif à l'époque, c'était juste de permettre à ces femmes de recevoir un fonds et de choisir l'activité qu'elles désirent et de la mener hein, et de venir rembourser plus tard. Donc, on n'avait même pas un suivi des activités. C'est plus tard, face au développement du portefeuille et à la demande pressante aussi de nos cibles que nous avons développé avec l'appui d'un programme de, de, de Terra Fina Star 
qui était au Sénégal pour développer un prêt agricole. Nous nous sommes lancés, nous avons développé ce nouveau produit il y a, il y a quatre ans à peu près. Et ce produit a commencé à prendre du succès. Mais à un moment donné, il y a eu un fléchissement donc, de, de l'évolution liée à une accumulation d'un pays. Et justement, c'est pendant ces moments-là que le programme, euh, le, le, la fondation Gramine Crédit Agricole, qui est un partenaire de plus de 10 ans de Corée Microfinance, nous a mis en relation avec Yapou dans le cadre de ce projet qui a été développé aussi avec la BNP Paribas. C'est dans nos discussions et avec l'offre qu'ils nous ont présentée que nous avons senti que c'était extrêmement pertinent de pouvoir s'engager. Et nous avons signé tout de suite une lettre d'engagement. Mais ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'ils ne viennent pas juste pour implémenter, en tout cas, leur offre, mais ils viennent commencer par une, un diagnostic, un diagnostic institutionnel, notamment du processus de crédit lié aux activités donc, agricoles, euh, de manière générale, hein, l'agriculture et l'élevage. Et à la suite de, cette, de ce diagnostic, ils nous ont démontré même pour certains produits la durée de remboursement n'était pas en conformité avec le cycle, le cycle de production. Parce que, je donne l'exemple, pour le riz, on avait donné six mois. Pour la maturité, il fallait quatre mois minimum pour que le riz arrive à maturité. Mais il fallait laisser sécher pendant, pendant, pendant un mois environ, passer donc un peu, comment on dit, euh, au moissonnage, battage, donc tout de suite, vous voyez, les six mois sont déjà épuisés. Et ça affiche au niveau de, de l'institution un impayé. Et c'est seulement deux mois après que les gens ont commencé à, à rembourser alors que la date est achetée. Ils nous ont montré que six mois, c'était déjà insuffisant, ce qui nous a amené à pousser et à mettre la durée du prêt à huit et neuf mois. Alors... À la suite de, ce, de, de cela, donc nous avons évolué. Hein, nous avons évolué en 2018, je crois, 2019, ce qui nous a amené donc à intégrer cet aspect d'analyse du crédit. Disons que donc c'est quelque chose qui est venu vers nous avec euh, les conseils et les orientations de partenaires, mais c'est venu au bon moment parce que ça représentait pour nous aussi un point faible pour notre institution. Pour ce qui est de l'impact. J'ai dit que nous étions dans une phase donc, pilote et, et en termes de volume, euh, je l'ai donné dans mon exposé, ça représente un peu moins de 500 000 dollars sur un encours de crédit, je crois, de plus de 23 millions de, 23 millions de dollars. Donc, pour ce qui concerne ce projet particulier, donc, voilà ce que ça représente. Par contre, ça ne représente pas ces 500 000 tout ce qu'on a financé sur l'agriculture. Aujourd'hui, l'agriculture prend de plus en plus de proportions dans notre portefeuille, autour de 15%. Je crois André Youm est dans la salle. Si je parle sous son contrôle, c'est le directeur du partenariat. Ça tournerait autour de, de, 15, de 15% pour le financement de l'agriculture. Et dans notre perspective, c'est que nous allons de plus en plus augmenter en tout cas, cette, cette, cette part de l'agriculture dans notre portefeuille, ce qui, justement, devrait nous justifier un peu l'élargissement de cet outil, de cette solution, au niveau de toutes nos agences et de toutes les régions du pays. Je ne sais pas si j'ai répondu un peu à la, aux questions qui ont été posées. Je vous remercie. Je pense so. Thank you very much, Lamine. And um, thank you all for bearing with us uh, that long and over time. Um, we will clearly finish now. Um, I apologize for, for the technical difficulties, especially for the panelists, Joanna, Isabel, um, if you can still hear us. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you, Lamine. Thank you, Raphael. And um, as we are all here for the rest of the conference. So should there be any questions, comments, please approach us. Um, I would have liked to pose more questions in the session. Now everyone has a well-deserved coffee break, and Charles, we better give the word to you.
Thank you so much, uh, uh, gentlemen, for very, very exciting. Usually, things don't go beyond time if they are boring. But if they are very interesting, they will go beyond uh, 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 the required mi minutes. Now, we're running out of time, and uh, mine is very, very simple. It's just to announce um, the subsequent uh, parallel sessions. I recommend that you look at the screens as you go down for coffee. Uh, that's so that you choose the one that you want to be in. The one here in this uh, main, in this same room is inclusive finance and green economy. The challenges for access to sustainable basic services. That's the one we shall have in this room. Uh, my second recommendation is that please pick your coffee and snack and come back with it. Uh, so that we can uh, save some of the time that we have lost. Just pick your coffee and go straight to, your, to the room that you want to be in. Thank you so much uh, and uh, enjoy your coffee. Thank you.